And Janice, thanks for your patience over to you. You're welcome. And thank you. It's nice to see people here today. Let's see if we can share easily without a hiccup. Hey, that part worked fine. Come on. Oh, I hope everybody sees the screen with my great great grandmother. We can. This this was a lovely discovery. I had this in my collection. Had no idea who it was, and then a cousin of mine said, "Oh, do you have a photo of my grandparents?" I don't think I do. Please send that to me. I went, "Yes, I do. I know who that is." One of the things that I always the first thing really that jumped out at me from this photo was, "Oh, she is so definitely wearing a shaitel." <laughs> Some of them you can really tell. So, finding the maiden names in your family tree. I like to find pithy quotes related to my topic. So, how simple a thing it seems to me that to know ourselves as we are, we must know our mother's names. Good incentive. While I realize that I am doing this primarily from a Jewish perspective, and this is a Jewish genealogy society, I also know that not all of us have 100% Jewish in our families. You have intermarriage or like me, my parents intermarried. I'm half and half. So if you have other customs in your family, you want to think about what they are. And changing a surname is not a universal tradition. It's primarily focused on Western Europe and by extension, the United States, since the majority of the immigration here came from Europe. But in some countries, says has Italy, France, and Asia, the maiden name might just be her name. It's not a maiden name. It's her name, and it doesn't change. Uh, for traditional Hispanic usage, you get compound surnames that change with every generation. And sometimes, and this did happen in Jewish, um, a man might adopt the family name of his wife, either for inheritance or to maintain a prestigious lineage. And that was not uncommon with some well-known rabbinical lines so as you're doing your search keep in mind what you see might be her original name to begin with don't get stuck saying i have to find it maybe you already did so as usual the first thing you should do is look at home by extension this is not only your home but you should make sure you have thoroughly scrubbed everything at home talk to any and all relatives you were in contact with if you know of relatives you're not in contact with, consider making them part of your circle because they might have information you don't. So funeral cards, though not necessarily as common in the Jewish community, very common in the Christian community, and you will often see a woman's maiden name listed on that. Photographs. Look at all the photographs you have. Pray some of them, if not all of them, are identified. If they're not, Try to get them identified as soon as possible while anyone who is alive might recognize people. I was just gifted scans of almost 6,000 photos from my father. I'm trying to get everything I need. Even if you have a photo without a last name, such as this example, it says on it, Maria and Sarah, 1856. Well, if this is in the States and going by the clothing, probably, maybe you can find a family in 1860 with try to estimate their ages and how much they would have aged in four years. In other words, if you have a clue on something, see if you can pursue it in some way, determine who those people are. Scrapbooks. Scrapbooks were incredibly popular at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And they might have themes or it just might be general family information. If there is one of these related to your family or in your family, go through it page by page and look at every single item in detail. Does it have information that can help you? Because you will often find news clippings for weddings and birth announcements and deaths. You'll find photos, you'll find memorabilia from events. School records sometimes get posted in these. Just comb it, every single item, what can they tell you? Book nameplates, not something most people think about, but often, especially as children, a lot of people will put their name in a book. So this one, this is my grandmother's Hebrew primer for when she started school. And it says Lillian Gordon. If I did not already know her maiden name was Gordon, now I have something I can pursue as a clue. Bible records. 
keeping in mind, yes, there are Jewish Bibles that get passed down in families also. So does it have a family record page? Is the information filled out? Great, now you have clues to work with. And I say clues, but you also need to do some analysis. As an example, this one, these entries look like they're in the same handwriting. Then you get a change to these that are light. Then you get a different handwriting. And then these two are different from those. If you have something that all the dates span something like 150 years and it's all in one person's handwriting, that was probably a gift at some point and someone copied the information. Oops, we've introduced the possibility of errors in transcription. You definitely use them as clues. If you have something that's all in original handwriting for each vague period, depending on where your breakdowns are, you can consider that a little more reliable in that these were probably written down right around the time of the event. So less time for people to forget. And the other problem with copying, oh, maybe you saw, oh, that's not spelled the right way. Let me change that because I know that has to be wrong. Well, you didn't know it had to be wrong. People introduce errors of their own deliberately and accidentally. Letters. Do you have any old letters? Read them all. Every single solitary word. Depending on what they're about, you may also want to consider transcribing them and sharing them with other family members electronically. But look at all the clues you have. In this one, we have Grandpa Bear and his wife, Mary Delmore. Okay, why she is using her maiden name? I don't know. But she is, and that's how it was written in the letter. I have a clue. Diaries, same thing as with letters. Read every single thing. I have a friend whose mother, wait, grandmother, kept a diary. Her husband's name was this really common Irish name in New York and Chicago. And like, I can't find a James Ward. Which one? I read the diary. She mentioned a cousin. She spelled the cousin's name wrong. But it was an unusual name, so I was able to find the cousin, and through that, got the entire family. One clue can change everything. Oral traditions. Lots of stories get passed down. I was just talking to somebody earlier who's had stories that were told. They may be right. They may not be right. We don't know. It's a good starting point. Use it as a clue. How do you research that oral tradition? What can you think of that can help you try to determine if it's accurate? But don't take it on its own as gospel. Try to figure out if you can confirm it or, for that matter, refute it. Hey, vital records. We tend to think of these as some of the best things for finding this kind of information, but in earlier versions might not have had as much information. So marriage records. First, you get registers. Just everybody put together one after the other. This is a narrative register. Thank you, Napoleon. This it was Napoleon who brought this style of record keeping to other parts of Europe as he conquered everything. So this is why you will find it in a lot of these older records. Most of it's boilerplate. Depending on what language it is, you may need help, but figure out where the key pieces of information are. Marriage records almost always have the woman's maiden name because they're saying this person who is not yet married Punk is getting married, up with the caveat. Depending on the period and the location, if it says Mrs., she's probably a widow, and that's probably her first husband's or prior husband's family name. You might need to go back and find the earlier record to find hers. Licenses, applications, and permission slips. These are wonderful because they all deal with prior to the marriage. Therefore, even more likely, we're getting a full name for that woman with her maiden name on it. Maybe you didn't find a marriage, but did you see a license in that area? Always check to see if the area you're researching has old licenses and old license applications in addition to the actual marriage record. More pieces of uh, documentation, more possibilities for finding what you're looking for. Certificates. Well, these are after the fact. Often all they have on it is the husband's and wife's names and maybe who performed the ceremony, a date where it was performed. Sometimes it's Mr. and Mrs. and you don't get her maiden name. And this certificate itself, you need to keep in mind, is not necessarily documentation attesting to a marriage. It's kind of saying, well, we got married. 
but did they? My mother was a notary public in Florida and they could perform marriages. And my mother performed marriages for people who could not legally get married. Um, we, she did lots of ceremonies for gay couples. She might have filled out a certificate like this, but there would be no documentation behind it. Depending on the circumstances, you might have something like that in your family too. You have a hint. Research it to see if you can find more documentation supporting it. Hey, affidavits, and this goes across the board, not just for marriages. There is no record for some reason. A record was destroyed or a common law marriage. So there was no record created for that. And somebody comes in and says, I swear that this happened. In San Francisco, after the quake and fire in 1906, several ministers went back in to City Hall and re-recorded the marriages they had performed because the originals were all destroyed. So it's not the original. It's as close as you're going to get. Maybe he copied something wrong, but that's all there is. Common law marriage, one of the quirks I've found, common law works on the basis of whatever state's rules are. So you live together seven years. Some places you present yourselves as man and wife to other people. Okay, you're, you now have a common law marriage. By definition, there is no paperwork. Colorado lets you create paperwork. So whereas before in common law, if you didn't have kids, you could each go your merry ways and there's no record and no problem. Oh, in Colorado, now you have a record. You don't want to be together anymore. You have to get divorced. I don't know why they created this, but I find it fascinating. Ministers returned. That actually works for rabbis also. A lot of ministers and historically most rabbis that kept records of the marriages they performed. Maybe that record stayed in a family and somebody didn't throw it away. Oh, do we like it when that happens? So now the kids have it and people transcribe information and put it online. Or maybe they gave it to an archive and they've put it online. Either way, the information is out there. Oops, I got it. Goodbye. There it is. Wedding bands. This was a historical thing. The purpose of which was to make sure that everybody knew John and Jane were getting married. In case somebody knew a reason that John or Jane should not be getting married. Maybe one of them's already married. And it was traditionally announced in for Christian, announced in each of their parishes for the week, three weeks preceding the wedding. They exist for Jews also. I don't know what the tradition was for how they were announced, but still the concept is let everybody know. And now we've put that in the marriage ceremony. If anyone here know any reason that this man and this woman should not be joined together in holy matrimony, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. Before you got three weeks notice, now you got three minutes before the minister says you're married. Same concept though. Is there some reason these two should not be getting married? So this is a marriage record from 1931. If I remember correctly, this is in Poland. And it tells you when the bans were announced. I thought that was fantastic. I've never seen that in a Christian record. The bands are usually recorded somewhere else. This one, they put the band dates in the marriage record so you know that they went out and announced it. Newspapers. Okay, I used to be the newspaper queen of the Bay Area. I love newspapers. Yes, you see marriage announcements in newspapers. They don't always, but they often include the, the woman's maiden name. Marriage bond. Kind of like the bands, part of the main purpose of this was making sure there was no reason that that guy shouldn't be getting married, that he wasn't going to skate out on it at the last minute. So he'd put up a bond or he'd have somebody else do it for him. You find that somebody else, uh, if it's not him, that person is almost always a relative because it's easier to get your relatives to put up money for you than some stranger. So if it's a name you don't recognize, Oh, wait, maybe that's someone on her side of the family and that's her maiden name. Look up every name on one of these that you find. More modern, we have marriage certificates where everything about one person is very conveniently put in one place, but never rely on only one record. 
for and this goes across the board. I was given a copy of this marriage certificate, which is for my great grandparents by my grandmother. She had her parents' marriage certificate. And on it, my great grandfather, Joe Gordon, said his mother's name was Lily Cortish. And that's what I put in my family tree. And then I started getting his siblings' marriage certificates. And they said mom's maiden name was Schneiderman. Well, those names don't have anything to do with each other. So I had to go out and research, and I finally came to the conclusion it was Schneiderman. I have no idea why my great-grandfather had the wrong name. One of the amusing things you will see often in records in the States that people Americanize the names of relatives who never came to this country. So my great-grandfather said his mother's name was Lily Cortish. His, sis, his brother Jaime said it was Leah Schneiderman. His sister Sarah said it was Lena Schneiderman. Well, her name was Esther Leah, and they Americanized it or put it down on the, it's three different given names. Now, that's something in Jewish research we are accustomed to, but it's something to keep in mind when you find different names. Is this really the same person? And they're just Americanizing the name in different ways. Death records. Some early death registers, mother's maiden name. And then what do we get? No, no. You N, you, we don't know. By the time the person's died, whoever's left around has no idea what mom's maiden name was. Means we don't get a hint to try to research. We come, we get death certificates later. And if everybody is on the ball and we have everything, so where's her name in here? I've lost it again. Mrs. Mary Garrity, whose father's name was John Walsh and whose mother's name was Julia Burke. That's what you want. Three different names. Go out and check them. Don't accept that whoever the informant was absolutely remembered what mom's maiden name was being asked to fill this out how many years later and under a stressful set of circumstances. People make mistakes. Mortuary and funeral home records. The convenient thing is a lot of these are coming online, but even if they're not, look at your death certificate. Who handled the death? Does that funeral home still exist? Has it now become part of another one? Did they keep the old one's records? You might go through multiple stages in this, but they often have tons of great information if you can find them. Oh, and here's what we were talking about earlier. Tombstones and cemeteries. Well, certainly in the States, the tradition historically for Jewish cemeteries, you get the person's name and the patronymic. And that's it. Usually does not have a family name in the Hebrew portion of the tombstone at all. If they have a dual language tombstone, it's usually there in English. But you always check because, well, it might have the last name. But the other thing is you also get the patronymic. Supposed to be Hebrew. It can help you with your other research. Oops, but wait a minute. We're back to... And who gave that information? The person's already did and didn't say, oh, my father's name was. It's still a stressful time. It can be incorrect. Something else you will often see on tombstones that can be incorrect, whether the person was a Kohen or a Levite. But we've always been told we were Kohens. Well, that doesn't mean you really were. Even people named Cohen are not always Kohen. So you need to check it. Obituaries and death announcements in newspapers. Lovely way to find out somebody's name. However, one of the things to keep in mind as you're looking through these, this is usually reasonably accurate, but here we have Mrs. Thomas McGillicutt, who was the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Lawler. So both the deceased and her mother have lost their given names. That is one of the big things. It's hard enough, oh, she changed her name. Now when she gets written about, you don't even have her own given name to follow up on keep plugging away we we do the best we can is it another relative body of james howard madden brother-in-law of ex-mayor t.e mcgillen okay that's a couple of steps but we can piece it together and we can work out is that is that her maiden name we want to go off and confirm it probate Historically, probate records have only been indexed under the deceased person's name. 
which means if you don't already know the woman's maiden name, well, you might have trouble finding it. The convenience of a lot of online collections is now they're indexing every name. So maybe you can find somebody that way. Um, even the other way, you might have to slog through more stuff. If you have already exhausted other possibilities, this can help you find a maiden name. Did somebody serve as the administrator or the executor and have to sign a bond? Who co-signed the bond? Just like with the bond for marriage, uh, marriage applications, usually a family member. You're not usually getting someone off the street to co-sign a bond with you and be responsible for money. So if it's a name you don't recognize, pursue that. It might be the name you're looking for. Guardianships. Now, historically, well, let me do it the other way. Modern days, we think of a guardianship as being over a person. Maybe somebody who's older and isn't able to take care of things himself or a child. Historically, there's only a guardianship if there is something valuable to guard. The guardianship is not for the people. It's for the property. So you will find... Man died, he asked a wife and four kids. No, there's no guardianship because they had nothing to inherit. They're now orphans because if the man died, they're orphans. If they still have a mother, nap, nah, sorry. We know she can't support them. So when you find guardianships, take into account what time period you're dealing with. If it's early, there's property somewhere and you need to figure out what that is. And if it relates to, maybe that helps you track down a name. When you see lists though, we have, Here's John English, surviving husband of Margaret English, and we have Kate Waters, and we have Bridget Horn. Okay, that must be their married names. Now we have their maiden names. Other things you can find in a probate file. This paragraph on this one has the full name and birth date and birth location of every child who was left. Gold mine. This probate file, oh, this one's so much. He left his will, so the will is part of the probate file, but you get an entire family history for this guy because rich people like to talk about their history. The late will of the late Philippe de Clocans deceased in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, he's probably Catholic. I declare having been born in Paris, October 1762, son of the late... Sieur Jacques Gédéon Charles François Philippe de Clocange, while living, director of the domains of His Majesty, the King of France, and secretary who said Majesty. Hey, you get an entire family history in this will. I don't have anybody that important in my family. Birth records. These are usually the last vital records to be codified in a given area. You start off as usual with a birth register. Full maiden name of mother and where she was born. Ooh. And then we still have some with no last name. Her, we just had a kid born. If the mother survived, she should be able to tell you her maiden name. Maybe she didn't survive, too. Birth certificates. Frank Madden and Isabel Hoffey. Again, most of the time, the mother is there to attest. So if it's a birth record... Most of the time, you'll get a maiden name. Christenings. So we have Edmund English and Mary Lawler. Okay, we have a maiden name. If we didn't, always look at the sponsors. Because if they don't, if they say Edward and Edmund and Mary English, you don't have a maiden name, our sponsors here are Lawler and Foley. You want to pursue those names because maybe one of those would be the family name you're looking for. Social Security. When that form is filled out nowadays, it's all automatic that, you know, you're born, boink, they give you a form. Earlier periods, you had to give the information yourself. It asks for your maiden name and the names of your parents, including your mother's maiden name. So if you're the one providing the information and you're a woman, in theory, if you have accurate information and are not trying to hide anything, we get all three names. Something to keep in mind, your complete social security file has additional documents relating to name changes if you did them. So if you got your social security and then you got married and you wanted it to be in that name, you had to file with social security administration, sending a copy of your marriage record saying, my name is now this. They actually keep all that. 
I have not yet determined a consistent way to get that from them, but they have it. So here we found somebody who followed the rules. Catherine Margaret Rosea, maiden name Catherine Davis, father's name Michael Davis, mother's name Emily Murphy. That's what you want. She was accurate. Everything was 100% accurate. Religious records. Membership lists. Lots and lots of places compile membership lists for their congregations. Is that list available? Now, see, this one is typed and alphabetized. Not as helpful because if you had before, they're usually grouped by families. Now they've made it alphabetical. So you might lose some people in context who are part of a family but didn't have the same last name. But they still have little hints here. So we have Mrs. M.E. parentheses Farron Carroll. Well, Farron might be her maiden name. Mrs. E. parentheses Stevens Cassidy. But we also have Miss I.R. Orton Carroll. Well, if she's a miss, why do we have something in parentheses? Did she used to be married? Does she like going by the name Miss? We don't know. You know, any given list, you look at it and figure out how it's put together. And then when you see anomalies, you might have to take a couple extra steps if that's the person you're researching. Did the congregation keep membership cards? Because this is how most of this used to be done. Did they still keep them today or did they give them to an archive? So here we have Anna Erickson, who later became Mrs. Norman Minogue. And look, they actually crossed out her given name and made her name on the card, Mrs. Norman Minow. I'm sorry, you no longer have your own identity. Thank you. You also get historical information, which may or may not help you research, addresses she has lived at, the time she paid membership dues, etc. Often you had to fill out an application for them to create that card. Do they still have the application? Read it, what does it tell you? For those religions and specific branches that have missions, they often kept separate records for the missionaries. Here we have Mrs. Well, it says Mrs. Print, uh, quote mark Theodore Fishbacher, but they actually gave her her name here. She's all of Virginia. But then she's also cross referenced on the card Mrs. All of Houston. We have her maiden name. We also have next of kin Fishbacher in Houston. Also gives you lovely things like the date of last arrival in the United States and port of entry, where and when they sailed, passport information. This one gives you so much more you can go out and try to find. Rabbi's records. As I said, historically in the U.S., generally speaking, rabbis kept their own records because the synagogue didn't keep vitals. So the rabbi would keep a record of, if he did, not everyone did, all the marriages he performed. These three rabbis kept their records and somehow Ancestry ended up with copies of them. Rather than have them separate, they lumped them into a database. Marriages performed by three rabbis. Kind of like three rabbis walk into a bar. Hmm. But Boston, Chicago, and quote unquote Massachusetts. Well, it's Western Massachusetts. So they lumped them together, but based on the location, you're going to be able to tell which rabbi we're dealing with here something to keep in mind if you have records in your family i have my grandparents ketubah and my great grandparents ketubah the traditional ketubah as far as the the top part which is written almost entirely in aramaic by the way not in hebrew it includes their hebrew names but not surnames it's strictly the patronymics i learned from my great grandparents ketubah but that my great great grandfather's hebrew name was isaac because it was Yoina Ben Isaac. He went by Victor in U.S., Avigdor in Russia. I said to my grandmother, did you know your grandfather's Hebrew name was Isaac? Oh, I can see that. How do you see Isaac becoming Victor? I don't know. But I got it from the ketubah. Now, the lower part of the ketubah that is not the traditional, not the Hebrew and Aramaic, you can find any names there. So you might find somebody's family name there. By the way, that's the only place on a traditional ketubah you're going to find a woman signing. Woman cannot be a witness for the Aramaic and Hebrew part. Traditionally, that doesn't mean people don't bend the rules. 
What other kinds of records do religious institutions have? They have meetings, meetings have minutes. Maybe your relatives were part of the administration. Can you find their names in there? Transfers from one congregation to another. Was there a religious school? Maybe there are records of your family members. Just as the rabbi usually kept his own records, the moyle usually kept his own records. Some of those have survived. By the way, something to keep in mind, religious records are private. They belong to the congregation and to the denomination. They can let us see them if they want to, but they are in no way obligated to. Even if it's your family and your mother or yourself, it's private records. They don't have to. So approach them with that in mind and be very nice. Legal records, contracts. Lots of family members get into business with each other. So maybe you'll find a joint business with family members. If you find names you don't recognize, go out and look for them. Is that the woman's maiden name? Between family businesses, loans from one person to another, guarantees of loans. Again, any name you don't recognize, those are probably family members or close friends because you don't just sign for somebody you don't know when it's about money. Adoptions. Adoptions today are still for the most part closed, though some states have been reopening them. They didn't used to be. They only started closing up in the mid 20th century. And there are some people who think that the main reason for that was because there were people trafficking, trafficking in babies willy-nilly across the country, and they didn't want to be tracked, and they convinced legislatures to lock up the records. Whatever the reason, that's when they started doing it. But before that, it was held in open court, nothing to be ashamed of, we're adopting a baby here, and you can find. So like these probate proceedings from Alameda County, 1922, James Leroy, adoption. I found somebody on lower on that same page, the file had the child's original birth record, a letter from the mother surrendering the child to the adoption agency, notes from the adoption agency assessing the child when he was put into one of their homes, notes from when families would come and interact with the child and what their assessment was of whether these would be good parents, everything. And that's the norm prior to them all being locked up. If you're lucky, if you're researching one, that state has either reopened them or I lucked out. I had a cousin who was adopted in 1940 in New Jersey, the year before they closed the records and I got his file. California, on the other hand, after they closed them, said, oh, you know, these are older than what the legislation says, but we're going to take them too. Well, gee, thank you very much. Divorces and legal separations. Some states will index the woman's maiden name, for the most part, you're going to find it under the married name. But one of the lovely legal concepts is that to undo something, you have to establish that it happened in the first place. So almost all divorce proceedings and legal separations include the date and location of the marriage. So if you haven't found it, but you know they got divorced, go look for the divorce. Except, of course, in New York City, which holds the records for more than 100 years because we might invade someone's privacy. Marital Settlement Agreement. Parties were married on the 5th day of August, 1957, in Sharon Springs, Kansas. Why, thank you. Especially since this particular one did not use her maiden name, Sheila Gebhardt's and Dale Gebhardt's. And if you know somebody got a legal separation, look for the paperwork because the only difference between a legal separation and a divorce is that the marriage is not dissolved. They go through the same steps of establishing the marriage, establishing whatever reason they're going to be separated, child support, division of goods, if that comes into it. Everything's the same, but the marriage stays together. That's what this one, this was actually for a separation because they were Catholic. Did somebody change her name legally? This one, very unusual, especially for the early period, 1905. Mrs. Arrington divorced W.H. Arrington in 1880. She paid him 3,000 for custody of their five children whom she raised. And she and two of these children now wish to assume her maiden name. Well, this is unusual 
But if it happened once, it could have happened again. If you know you have any kind of a separation of the family or the family you're researching, go out and look for all those records. And you also get a note that the children filed separately, but they cross-referenced them on her record. Civil and criminal cases. Do family members ever get mad at each other? Nah. So you have family fights and disagreements. Child abuse, of course, is a separate kind of problem. Breach of contract, out of wedlock children, paternity suits. All of these things create legal records. And just ask Judy Russell, we love legal records. But there's nothing new under the sun. In 1758, two and a half centuries ago, the grand jury presented Barbara Remy for having a baseborn, i.e. illegitimate, child within six months past, and James Whaley Jr. for absenting from his wife and taking up with another woman, his wife's sister. So not only did he have an affair with his sister-in-law, he got her pregnant and she had the child. Nothing new under the sun. And this is to try to make sure that that child's going to be supported. Because government doesn't want to pay for it if we know who the father is. Prison, probation, and parole records. Same thing. It's legal. They like records. So you will find intake records if somebody went into prison. If they later went on probation or on parole, there are going to be records about that. You sometimes get family histories in that. So here we have Dr. Lena Engst Therio. Subject was born Lena Engst, September 6, 1906, Nez Perce County, Idaho. One of three children born to Ed and Pauline Engst. Father was a native of Leipzig. Mother, a native of Minnesota of German descent. We get a whole history there. Sometimes in prison or uh, jail files, you will find documentation from family members. Maybe they're attesting to the person's character. Maybe they're saying, oh, please, God, don't let him out on parole. I saw that smile, Debbie. <laughs> Asylum and sanitarium proceedings. Um, as we learned from, oh, I've forgotten his name again. His first name's Steve, and he was an investigative reporter with the Washington Post, and he was a speaker at the LA IAJGS meeting. He found out after his both of his parents had died, there was a third person in the plot, and it was his mother's sister who had had some kind of mental health problems and had been institutionalized her whole life, but they'd never heard of him. Even as an acknowledged, world-known investigative reporter for the Washington Post. He couldn't get any of her sanitarium records. But you can often get them through legal records because to institutionalize someone, you have to show they need to be institutionalized. You go to court. You say, here are records from this doctor who says, oh my God, this woman should not be running around on the streets by herself. But now it's a legal file and you get a copy of it. So Sometimes historical asylum records might be in an archive, sometimes even that way. Oh, they're 150 years old. I'm sorry, you can't see that. That's HIPAA. No, HIPAA did not exist 150 years ago, you idiot. If you get that from somebody, come back again with your hip copy of the HIPAA. Can you please show me where in HIPAA it says I can't see something from 150 years ago? It never hurts to try. But if they are institutionalized or there's something like that, See if you can find legal records relating to it. It's an easier way to get those records. The poorhouse. We don't really have these the same way nowadays. We just have welfare in general. But in the 19th century, it was also called the county farm or the county poor farm or the almshouse. And it was where people went when they couldn't support themselves, especially if women with children. And they have records. Um, John Michael O'Neill, a genealogy writer, one time wrote about how he sorted out because he had an ancestor who had been married twice and he sorted out which kids belonged to which wife by the poorhouse admittance records. And a lot of these are filmed by the LDS church. So if you have anyone that that might be relative to check family search catalog. Newspapers. Well, I already mentioned you can find wedding announcements. So here we have Miss Steinfurst is the bride of C.M. Jackson. We have a, an engagement announcement or a wedding announcement before it happened. October 31st has been fixed as the date of the marriage of Miss Adeline Ullman and Mr. Louis Steinfurst. 
obituaries. This is wonderful for tracking down married names of daughters. So here we've got two sons, Harry and Dr. Sable, five daughters, Mrs. Charles Roscoff, Mrs. E. Mellon, Mrs. Greenberg. Hey, I just realized that, that E. Mellon, that's her name for the initial. That's not the husband's name. Mrs. Max Solomon, Mrs. J.J. Seidelman. Something to keep in mind, as with death certificates, it's not the dead person, generally speaking, who is writing or giving the information. So this particular example, she never used the name Sable in her entire life. Her sons, Harry and Daniel, Americanized their name to Sable. So I only found this roundabout through three back doors. Her name was Sabladovsky. But whoever wrote the obit Americanized her name to match what her sons were using. So how's that for sneaky? Did visitors come from out of town or did visitors go to another town? Mrs. Hiram Miller is visiting her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Fellows. We have a family reunion at the head home of Mr. and Mrs. Banky. And then we get Englishes and Banky and Borman. And you put them all together and you got a bunch of married women. And now we have the maiden name because of all their siblings that they're visiting. Anniversaries. Did someone in the family have a big one, like a 50 or a 60, 70, 75? Those are often written up in the newspaper. And they will usually talk about, oh, and John Smith and Jane Doe were married on this day 60 years ago. Except sometimes they're off by a year. It gives you the maiden name, but now, oh, I want to go find the marriage record. When I found this one, I went back and the they were off by a year. The wedding had actually taken place, I think, the year earlier. So they were celebrating the 51st anniversary. I still found the write-up, though, which is good. And I verified they had not gotten her maiden name wrong after all that time. Advertisements for probates and land. Sometimes this is related to who else is in the family. Look at all the names. Is there one you don't recognize? Censuses. I was talking about censuses earlier. Look at everybody in the household. Look at all the names. So you might have family members living with their parents. Oh, look, here's Daniel Sable. Here's Phoebe, Mrs. Charles Roscoff. Mrs. E. Mellon, her, her husband's name was Abraham. So that was her initial, not her husband's. And who's their mother? Lena Sabladovsky. Like I said, she never used the name Sable in her life. Her death certificate says Sabladovsky, but they didn't let that go in the uh, obit. Do you have a parent living with children? So here we have Ellis and Jenny Stein first. Rachel Weinstein, mother-in-law. Aha, that's Jenny's mother. Caution, is that her maiden name or has her mother remarried at some point afterward? So it's a starting point, and in this case, it was the maiden name, but it is not guaranteed, especially if she's quite elderly. She may have gone through her husband or three. Do you have other, oh, you like that one too, Debbie, huh? <laughs> Are there other family members? So here we have Harry and Bessie Sable, and living in the household, Morris Cohen, brother-in-law. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I found Bessie's maiden name, and then I found the marriage record, and yes, it is definitely her maiden name. Also look at not just in the household, but especially you should be tracking your family over time in every single census. You should be. Who else is living nearby? Are they constantly living near the same people? Oops. Hold on. Another orange juice break. So in 1870, we have Alonzo Durham, and his wife, Mary, living next to the Markley family. In 1880, Alonzo Durham and his family living next to the Markley family. Like three or four censuses, and guess what? Mary's maiden name was Markley. Something like 30 years, they were living next to their in-laws. Land records. I look for every record I can find on my family members for everything. In fact, I just put two and two together this morning, think something happened in my head. But do you have a low-cost sale for $1? Do 
for love and affection, 99% of the time, that's a family member. Last name you don't recognize? Oh, go check that last name. Maybe that's your maiden name you're missing. Is there a maiden name in the contract? Do they mention somebody and say et ux, which means et and spouse in Latin? Women have dower. Does that show up? They also have um, life use of land sometimes after the husband has died. Surety. So again, somebody guaranteeing. Any names in any of these records you don't recognize, pursue every one of them. Do you have families living next to each other on a map? Now, I found them in the census for a different family. But Ancestry has a lot of these historic maps where they have the families who are living on them, who owns the land. And I was following along and I found four lots next to each other that kept saying the same last name, same last name. And then one in the middle suddenly changed last names. One of the daughters got married and the, the son-in-law was granted some of the land. Other things, there's always so much more to look for. Pension records. Pension records, early years when you had to submit everything on paper, you had to prove you were the widow of somebody to be able to get a pension. Well, how do you prove it? A marriage record. You might have sent an original. You might have sent an affidavit. There might be interviews with family members. This one's an affidavit from the, from the records office, Law Division of Pensions, in response to your call relating to the case of Martha, Martha Stodgill in Portales, New Mexico, as a widow of John Stodgill. You are advised it is shown from a certified copy of public records of Gallatin County, Kentucky, John S. Stodgill and Martha Dyson were married January 30th, 1861. Remember what I said earlier about when people copy information and they can do, introduce errors? Her name isn't Dyson, it's Tyson. I went looking for Dyson and couldn't find it. Oh, whoever typed up this lovely letter to the Bureau of Pensions, the auditor of the War Department, to say that she was eligible for that pension, typed her maiden name wrong. So always double check. Civil service job application. This is considered public information because this was part of working for the government. And they actually asked for family members. Now this woman was not married, so she didn't have anything about a spouse or children, but if somebody's married, her parents are gonna be listed on there. Yay, I found a maiden name. Naturalizations. Not often, but sometimes they'll sneak one in on you. So here, Gedalia David is talking about his wife's name, Lena Goldberg David. Cool, thank you. That, by the way, is Hal David's grandfather. Passport applications. Used to be that a woman had to list her father's name on her passport application. Men didn't have to, just the women. But then you get Mary Jane Wilson's father's name was James Trevesky, and you get where he was born and when, when he immigrated, when he became a citizen, which means you now have a further generation back. Later, they eventually did have men also fill out that part, but it started up just the women had to uh, say who their father was. Hooray for biased records. Blah. Voter registration. At least in some jurisdictions, this came from Oregon, they ask for your parents' names, including your mother's maiden name. So you also have groups, organizations, sororities, fraternities, lineage societies, heritage societies. A lot of these are related to your family history, so they ask for the information. This application was for the Sons of the American Revolution, full maiden name of applicant's wife. Ada Odessa Stump. Yeah, I think I'd want to get married with a name like that too and get rid of it. And as I have been constantly saying, double check everything. This is an application for the, oops, not D-A-R, United Daughters of the Confederacy. And I was researching this family for a lady I was working with and she knew her grandmother had applied to UDC. And it took her a year to be willing to pay the $3 for a copy of the application. She shouldn't have been doing genealogy. <laughs> so 
So we get Katie Falconer born on where she was born. I claim disability as, excuse me, eligibility as stated below from Benjamin Milligan. One of the things about UDC, it didn't have to be your ancestor. It could have been a sibling of your ancestor. And then she gives this lovely family history here. Her parents, Albert Faulkner and Martha Milligan. That was right. Her parents, William Milligan and Sarah Sawyer. Not quite right. And then the said William Milligan was the brother of Benjamin Milligan. No, he wasn't. He didn't spell his name Milligan. He spelled it Milliken. He was a Confederate veteran, but he was not related to this family. I do not know why the person at UDC approved this. There's almost no information there. They Maybe they were desperate for members, but when you get something like this, check everything. It just might not be accurate. Okay, people publish things. So lots of people nowadays in particular, but also earlier periods, publish family histories. Did they give you any documentation? Did they include what their sources were? If not, and if it's just a big family tree, eh, you're going to want to check every single thing. Especially in the 19th century, early 20th century, there were some companies and people who deliberately did not bother to make sure it was accurate. They fulfilled the desires of their clients. Will you please tell me if I'm descended from the King of England? Oh, they will make you descended from the King of England. So if it doesn't give you sources, you're going to want to check every single solitary thing. On the other hand, some people are very good. Somebody did a 540-page book on my paternal grandmother's family and included copies of lots of the documents, citations to all these places he found information, caveats. Okay, I've got this family back to 1508 in Lancashire, England, and these are people with the same last name that I have shown are not directly connected. So when you have something like that, awesome. I mean, he still might be lying, but he's doing a really detailed job of it. Something like this that just has the family tree, you got to check every single thing. I'm glad I'm entertaining you, Debbie. <laughs> um, county histories. These were really big in the 19th century. They're also called mug books because they often had photographs. And they go around to the up and coming people and the established people in a given area and say, hey, would you like to be in the book? Write us your information. Well, some people didn't quite give accurate information. They may have fleshed out their history or covered up some stuff. So go ahead and check it as you, unless there's some source there, which I've never seen in one of these books, check it all. But they make really good clues. But here you have an example. John Lawler is a son of Jeremiah and Margaret English Lawler. Why, thank you. I can go look for a marriage record. Oral history collections, for example, from Holocaust survivors. A, an established technique when you do an oral history, at the beginning, you ask your subject to identify herself. What's your name? Who are your parents? When and where were you born? A lot of these are online now, especially for Holocaust collections. So what was your father's name? Alec Weiss. Alec, yeah, E-L-E-K. Mother's name, Cecilia Attel. Thank you. I have her parents from her mouth. High school yearbooks. Probably not the first thing you're going to think of, but if you have an unusual name or unusual in that location, maybe you can find her in a yearbook by manually going through and looking through the pages. Or if it's on Ancestry, you can search for given names. So my aunt's maiden name is Mick Strowell which was a made-up name. If it's a mixed trial, it's that family. And I happened to find her aunt, for whom she was named, going to uh, West Division High School in Milwaukee, Edith McStrowell. But if you had somebody named Xenia and you knew she was in Milwaukee, well, that's not a common given name. You could search for Xenias. There's a Xenia in this class. Maybe she's the only one in the entire school. Do I like Kuchenreuter? That's a catchy name. Along with the books themselves being published, there are more and more indices to books being published or collections. So you can just look up the name and then get the reference and find it. And because it is easy to do so, you are seeing more diaries and journals. 
they were either publishing them in print, possibly just publishing them online so people can read them. If you, you know, Google your name, see if you find them in one of these things. Be creative in your online searches. Oops, go back to that. So like I just said, Google, do you have a very uncommon name? Just Google the name. If it's more common, put in delimiters so that you don't get every John Smith. You know, John Smith in Niceville, Florida. There were probably still more than one of them. Yes, there's really a place named Niceville. I used to live there. It's the only Niceville in the country. But put other things that can limit that. Okay, your name is common. Fine. Like, what's the um, Garfunkel? Garfinkel. I actually found out it's really common. But if I say in a newspaper database online, Garfinkel's in Winnipeg, Montana, uh, Manitoba, all those Garfinkel's are my cousins. There are no Garfinkel's who went there, not related. We haven't found out if we're related to Simon Garfinkel, but hey, maybe. Um, LDS records. The International Genealogical Index is actually reliable. That's where they sent out church members to originally photograph. Now they just sent out digital photography. Or, but every record from like, okay, they went to DeWitt County, Texas, and they were allowed to copy all the vital records that they had there. So when there's an index online of marriages from DeWitt County, they took those from the records that they were able to microfilm there. So it's pretty reliable up to the point that they transcribed it and you can always introduce an error in transcription. On the other hand, ancestral file and pedigree resource file are people's family trees. Not only do people sometimes fantasize about them, um, because one of the things about the LDS church is that you are baptizing ancestors, they will put people in a tree who shouldn't be there just so they can baptize somebody. They'll put women without last names just so they can baptize somebody. So much less reliable as a record source than the IGI. Use it as a hit. Does it give you something you can go try to verify? If they give you such little information that there's nothing you can make sure it's accurate, feel free to ignore it. Genealogy query columns. These were very common when genealogy magazines in print were the thing. We know that this is not the case nowadays, but they existed. Some of them are online. Um, a lot of Genealogy Society newsletters are available from the Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center. They have deliberately gone out and collected as many as they can get their hands on because the church does not emphasize collecting those. So Allen County has many, many more of those than the church does in Salt Lake. And if you're researching a specific area, maybe somebody asked about your family name. Nowadays, you find this type of thing online. One of the best sources has been RootsWeb. But after so many years of owning RootsWeb and leaving it alone, Ancestry has announced that it will become read-only as of 2024. So not going to be a good source anymore for people continuing to contact to each, each other. Oops. I'm going to leave you hanging on also consider while I get more orange juice. Was her name the same? Here we have a nice little newspaper squib. Aaron Brown was a passenger accompanied by his daughter, Mrs. T.G. Brown. So she went and married somebody else named Brown. And it happens. And of course, for genealogy, the most famous one is Megan Smileniak Smileniak who did deep research and figured out she and her husband are not related in a genealogically relevant time frame. With a name like that, who was expecting that answer? Look at your naming patterns. So for Ashkenazim, the tradition, and remember, it's a minhag. It, not everybody followed it, but the tradition is after a deceased ancestor. So what you will often see is the second generation down, you see names repeating. Or you, or you might just see, if you don't know the Hebrew name, you might see the initial. So I have three male cousins from one generation, all S's. Okay, one, uh, two or three generations back, I'm pretty sure I've got an ancestor whose name started with an S. Still haven't figured out what the Hebrew or Yiddish name is, but I know it's got to be an S. 
then you get weird things like, I know my great great grandfather was Gersh Wolf, and I have found nobody named after him three generations down. I don't know if he was still alive or he was such an asshole. Nobody wanted to name a kid after him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got Debbie. Oh, I got Rob too. <laughs> but look for the pattern. It definitely gives you hints and it can give you delimiters for, oh, this person was probably dead by now because this kid was named after him. Sephardim, yep, totally different system. You name after living ancestors. Generally, the first son, the father's father, second son, mother's father, etc. Like I said, their traditions, their generalities, they're not written in stone. Not everybody's going to follow them. Um, for English language, especially among upper class, it was very common for a while to give children the mother's maiden name as a middle name. So I, John Foote married Georgina Lay and their daughter was Olive Lay Foote. I have not researched her family. I don't know if her siblings also were Lays. But, but she married Edwin Elias Sellers, whom I did research. And all five of their sons had Foot as the middle name, including Paulding Foot Sellers, who had the audacity to name his son Paulding Foot Sellers Jr. <laughs> Hispanic names, you get the compound surnames. So I remember when I was a kid watching some show and all I remembered was this woman up there saying, my name is da 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 but you can call me Vicky. Well, that was Vicky Carr, and her full name is Florencia Vicenta de Casillas Martinez Cardona. Yeah, Vicky's a lot easier to say. And then you have Margot, whose full name is Maria Margarita Guadalupe Teresa Estela Bolado Castilla y O'Donnell. I have no idea where that O'Donnell came from, but it so doesn't fit her name. It, it, well, the basic tradition for that, you have your father's name, and then the second name is your mother's maiden name. You go by your father's name if you're only using one. If they follow that, especially in the States, it can get totally messed up. Then you know that second name is the mother's maiden name. When you get married, I now drop my mother's maiden name. I keep my father's name, so I use my husband's name, and then my father's name as the second name. I, so I'm not using my mother's maiden name and my name name anymore. If it's a really prestigious family, this is when you start getting like um, Margo with Bolado Castillo y O'Donnell and even uh, Vicky, Casillas, Martinez, and Carter. So you might get three or four names or even more sometimes if they really want to show off how important they are. Okay, people change their names. Well, we know. We're Jews. We know people change their names. Often to assimilate. So my great-grandfather came here as Yorna Garadetska, and less than a year later, he was Joe Gordon. And all his siblings, when they came over here, they up, oh, they came over as Garadetska, and then they changed it to Gordon because he had already established the new name for the family. Um, that helps you assimilate. It can help you hide ethnicity. Now, for that, Garadetsky is not particularly Jewish. It's just Russian. But you get people who want to hide that they're German during World War One and World War Two. Even famous people have to deal with that. Um, are you running away from past problems? Is that why you changed your name? Well, in that case, maybe you shouldn't announce it in a newspaper. Somebody I'm researching did. He announced in a newspaper, I'm changing my name. This is why. Like, everybody's after you because you're a con man. Now you told them. Um, do you have a more prestigious family name? This was not uncommon with rabbinical dynasties. If one rabbi only had daughters or, you know, he maybe even had a son, but somebody wants to marry his daughter, he's a rabbi. He will often change his name to that of the established lineage. So now he gets to ride on the coattails. Um, did somebody change a name for an inheritance? People actually do that. Somebody told me in a class once at IJGS that someone, one of his ancestors had done it, but then he never got back to me. But I found a famous one I'm going to show you. Um, people change from politics or religion. In Canada, I had somebody tell me he's done deep French Canadian research. He said he's never seen a person who did not have a deep name. Deep means said, but in context, also known as. And except for one person I found, I have found him to be accurate. 
Everybody has an alternate surname that they use. It's just what they did. So sometimes you'll find them under one record, I mean, in one record under one name, sometimes another name. And you have to keep track of both names as if our work wasn't hard enough. Um, formerly enslaved people in this country after emancipation sometimes change their name two or three times. We used to be anecdotally, oh, they all took their former master's names. Well, no, they didn't. More than half of former slaves or descendants of changed their name to Freeman or Washington. Well, Freeman's self-explanatory. Washington after the first president in this country. So they didn't, but they might have found been looking around for a name they liked. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about how marriage changes a woman's name in several countries. And sometimes you'll find a misspelling. And then that one ends up sticking. That comes to some degree out of earlier times when most people could not write. And they were telling a clerk, this is my name. And the clerk wrote down what he heard. And sometimes that's what became the name. So here are some examples of name changes. I already told you, Garadetsky to Gordon. My aunt's grandfather was Moskaleb Struhl. And when he became a citizen, he actually wrote a letter to naturalization services. Only time I've found a handwritten letter in a file. When I become a citizen, I want to change my name to Leo Martin McStrow. And the family information was he wanted it to sound not Jewish. Well, McStrow does not sound Jewish, but he totally made up a name. So if you know he totally made up a name, now you know McStrow's are Jewish because he was Jewish. Um, I know a guy, his family was Italian, but they didn't like Italians in the area that family was. So, oh, no, 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 we're French. Our name is Vaillant. On the other hand, I know a guy whose family name was Dornier, which is French, but they didn't like French in that area. So they changed the name to Ordorni and pretended to be Irish. <laughs> Who don't they like? Oh, we're not them. We're somebody else. Um, the con man I was talking about, his name was Jodas, Joseph Eidelbalt Durham. He changed his name to Adelbert Durham Lloyd and had an article written in the newspaper about it. How do you hide from your past when you're telling everybody? Uh, and speaking of John Smith, I know a guy named John Smith, but he wanted to become a performer. Well, that's not a good name for a performer. So his performance name is James Ernest. Religion, you get Damien Jamal converted to Judaism and became Nissan Baruch. Now, not necessarily many people have heard of Stephen Dimitri Yordiu, but when he became a performer, he wanted to name people would remember. So he changed it to Cat Stevens. And then, of course, he converted to Islam, so he changed his name to Yusuf Islam. You never know. But inheritance, I found someone who did it. I'm sure most of you have heard of the actor, Carrie Elwes. Well, his umpty umpth great-grandfather had an uncle on his mother's side named Megget, who told him, if you change your name to Megget, you get the inheritance. So he did. I mean, the, excuse me, the other way around. They were maggots, and they, he changed it to Elwes. And Mr. Elwes was apparently extremely wealthy, which is why Mr. Maggot found it a very convincing incentive. And after that, the Elwes family has been wealthy since then. So I guess it paid off. Um, and more rarely, you will see people combine their names. And I, it's rare because not all names lend themselves to it. So I know Michael and Lisa Pondsmith, but I didn't know for many years that they were originally Michael Smith and Lisa Pond. That worked beautifully. I worked with Shannon Apple. When he married Kimberly Klein, they became Apple Klein. Not quite as smooth as Pond Smith, but it works. And lots of people have heard of Antonio Villarragosa, big in politics, but he was originally Villar and combined his name with his wife, Raigosa. So sometimes the name you're seeing only got created in that generation. I mean, it was just, you know, they all three of those are made up names. McStrowell, if I see McStrowell anywhere, that's my aunt's family because he made the name up. If you have one of those in your family, oh, you are so lucky. Now, other weird things. Was somebody using his mother's maiden name? In some areas of Europe where they tried to control Jewish marriage, they'd say, oh, 
this is how much it's going to cost you for a marriage license and made it prohibitively expensive. Or I think it was Bohemia where they said only the eldest son can get married. That didn't stop people from getting married. They got married under the chuppah. But that means civil marriage, they were not legally married. So you will find children registered under the mother's maiden name. Now, I know in Galicia, where that was very common, that's one of the places where it was, they made the marriage license so expensive. If once they were, oh, you know, we think we're all going to go to the Golden of Medina. We're all leaving. At that time, you will sometimes find the parents go back. They'll get a civil marriage and they will have all the children re-registered under the father's name so that the names will all match when they go. Some people didn't bother. Here we have Abraham Tepper, father's name, Myron Neumann, mother's name, Gittel Tepper. So he's using his mother's maiden name, and he says he's from Austria. I would bet you dollars to donuts that man is from Galicia, and his parents did not have a civil marriage. So it's a really big hint. Um, sometimes you will find a woman keeping her maiden name. Historically, that was very uncommon. But during the suffragist movement, it gained some traction. Some women just had enough ego that they did it. Much more common nowadays, in particular, as people are marrying when they're older and a woman has an established career, she'll keep her maiden name because that's the name she's known under. And sometimes they do it for public, but in private, they don't. So Betty White, that was her maiden name. She used that for her entire career. But when she married Alan Ludden, she that is the name she used privately. I got to meet her one time. She came and talked at USC and I called her Mrs. Ludden. You should have seen the joy on that woman's face. She adored her husband. She loved being called Mrs. Ludden. But everything in public was Betty White because that's the name she established her career under. I mentioned earlier, if you have other countries you are dealing with, and this even does include for Jews, Sometimes Jews would adopt some of the traditions of the countries they went to, because let's face it, we're always on the move. So investigate, are there other traditions that might be affecting your family that you need to know about? It's like Quebec, France, Italy, that's the woman's name. You will find Italian women immigrating to this country under their name. And as soon as they get here, they start using their husband's name because that's the tradition here. But the passenger list is going to have whatever her name was in Italy. Spain's compound names that can get bloody ridiculous. But look to see what other traditions you might be affected by. And if you still haven't found her, or even at the beginning, this is a helpful thing. Create as detailed of a timeline as you possibly can for that woman. Look for every single solitary record you can find for her, her husbands, her children, and her entire fan club. Fan club being friends, associates, and neighbors. No, it is not family, associates, and neighbors. You're already researching family. It's friends. Historically, records primarily focused on men. But look for everybody. You'll probably find more records for men. And then use every single detail from those records where you can place her at a given place in a given time. Because that's how you find records. You need a place and a time. So if there's a child born, well, it's guaranteed she was there at the time. Was she there for a Brit Mala or a naming? Well, maybe not. Not all verses. I mean, a lot of times the woman's name doesn't get mentioned, isn't on the record. She might have been in the area, maybe. Marriages. Well, we assume she was there when she got married. Um, look for the deaths of her parents. Look for the deaths of all the in-laws. Every record you can find for her children. Deaths of every single spouse if she married multiple times. Look for everything. Yes, I am obsessive. And maybe after all of that, and you're beating your head against the wall. You really do get to figure out what your great-great-grandmother's maiden name was. Because it was Esther Leia schneiderman Garadetsky, not Kortish. So go out and look for your Bubby's maiden names, guys. And I will stop sharing. And no questions got put into chat. Wait, nobody has any questions? I'm taking questions. Ask me things. 
Okay, Karen, you raised your hand. And then Mike, Karen first. Ah, no, 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 I saw your hand first, Karen. Come on. I was saying the ear because I saw Debbie talking, but we couldn't hear her. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, in that just... case, Mike, what's your question? Uh, this is more, uh, I guess, a fact or theory than a question. Um, we, our family uh, was visiting my grandmother's grave and on her tombstone, it said, uh, Idol Bas Abraham. Okay. So we made the apparently incorrect assumption that her father's name was Abraham. Well, based on that information, it was not an incorrect hypothesis. Okay. Well, as it turns out, uh, it apparently wasn't, but, um, the apparently if they did not know the father's name they used abraham on the tombstone okay i've never heard that before um i i've never heard that there was a standard substitution for a father's name but as with death certificates you're dealing with after the fact um especially in here in the states if they did not Maybe it's an immigrant and her father never came, depending on how long after she came, how old was she when she died, how much did she talk about the old country? Did they know her father's name mm -hmm. or did they misremember it? So just as you can have inaccurate information on that death certificate because you're dealing with secondhand information in a stressful time, they could have simply misremembered her father's name. But I've ne I've never heard of... Oh, if you don't know, put the name Abraham there. Um, I'm not saying it isn't. I've just never heard of that before. Okay. I thought I had. Um, okay. I'm actually looking, uh, and this is in Jewish gen. Okay. Uh, that it says Ben Avraham is used on tombstones when the father's name is unknown. Aha. Uh -huh. What page is that on? What, what category is that under? Okay. I Googled. Uh, what did I Google here? Uh, Jewish grave unknown father Abraham. You are an excellent Googler, sir. That's a very good way to do that search. Okay. Well, in that case, if it is traditional, it might be because Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. I could kind of see that logic. I've never heard that before. So thank you for telling us that. Um, but based on your knowledge at the time, and obviously there are men named Abraham or Avram or whatever. It was not an incorrect hypothesis at the beginning. Out of curiosity, do you have a death certificate? What does it say for her father's name on that? Uh, I do. And I think it was unknown. Okay. <laughs> well, that tells you where they got Abraham. That's that's definitely different, though. I, um, I'll keep that in mind if I ever find an Abraham on a tombstone again. Okay. Do you think that, that there might be something similar for women to use the name Sarah, for example? Yeah, but generally on a tombstone, you don't put the matronymic. You put the patronymic. Okay. So they're not going to worry about Sarah. Okay. But if, <clears throat> if they did, they might use the same kind of logic. Um, Janice, I noticed how many... Uh, sources of yours were newspapers. And um, I have had a paid subscription to newspaper.com and found that useful. Are there any other uh, databases perhaps that are free where you would find things like wedding announcements, et cetera? Um, let me see. I, I'm going to look up a URL. Um, newspapers, lots and lots of them are available online for free. You can use Newspaper Archive for free at LDS Family Search Centers. Um, the Chronicling America database is your tax dollars at work. That is digitized newspapers from around this country. And that's all free. Um, let me look at, let me see, I want Wikipedia. There's a page on Wikipedia, which I'm looking up the URL for. Uh, online newspaper archives. Oh, come on. Give me the page. I, I think there's one called Elefind. Elefind is not a database. Okay. Elefind is a search engine that searches newspaper databases. 
Okay. Oh, God bless it. They did. Hold on. Newspaper archives online. Ah, thank you. Let me try that one. Why are you not finding me in my database, you stupid people? <clears throat> snarl, snarl. While Janice is searching, uh, uh, go ahead um, search anyway, her. the other the other thing to say, specifically in context of Jewish research, lots of Jewish newspapers have been digitized, and generally speaking, they're free online. Um, one of the really cool collections. Pittsburgh digitized all of its Jewish newspapers. Um, so it's Spurtis. Um, there were three different historical newspapers in Pittsburgh and also like a community newsletter thing. They've all been digitized. It's one of the few static collections you'll find online. They have some issues missing, but other than that, they've, they've done them all. Um, the Jewish Sentinel where that obituary I showed you with Lena Sable, um, that came from that collection. Excuse me. Yeah, Jewish Criterion. Uh, Jewish Sentinel is the Chicago Jewish newspaper. It's online for free. Uh, Detroit News, that's online for free. There are half a dozen really big Jewish newspapers that were digitized by ProQuest. Um, those are paid databases. But we are very lucky. Most of our newspapers are digitized and online free. So you would do a Google search uh, to find out which newspapers might exist, such as Detroit Jewish newspaper or newspapers. And then you'd have a list. Yes. And I finally found my URL for the other one. Ha <laughs> ha. Did you put that into chat for us? Yep. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Wikipedia has a page of online newspaper archives. Okay. Most of them are clearly marked whether they are paid or free. Um, when I first gave a talk about online newspapers, I was bemoaning the fact that there was no one place online you could find lists of online newspaper archives. And one time Googling, I found that. So the second time I gave the talk, I said, hey, use this page. Um, thank you. Yes, it's Chicago. Um, I always tell people it's Wikipedia. You can add things to the page because everybody can edit Wikipedia. If you find something not on the page and you don't want to deal with Wikipedia, send it to me and I'll add it to the page. But that is one of the best places to start looking because it lists just names of newspapers in different and by location outside the U.S., inside the U.S. Um, another free site, though, it's very eclectic, weird to use and you have no idea what he's got there. Um, a man named Tom Trainsky, when he retired, he got bored and said, what am I going to do with my time? Somehow he latched onto digitizing newspapers. So. You, you broke up there for a moment, Janice. What was the name of that resource? Um, that's what I did. Ah, I, obviously my brain is having farts this morning. Hold on. <laughs> All right, it might come to you. It, oh, it will. There we go, Fulton History. Hold on. And this is actually particularly good for New York. So FultonHistory.com started off originally as his collection of upstate New York postcards. And then he got bored and started digitizing microfilmed newspapers. It is totally free. The original focus was upstate New York newspapers. Then he expanded to around New York City. Now, any newspaper he can get his grubby little fingers on. The good part, it's free. The bad part, it's weird. Um, he doesn't always have them scanned cleanly. His search doesn't always work perfectly. And he doesn't label the files in any intelligible manner that you can look at it and say, oh, that's this newspaper. Um, I recommend if you have anybody in New York to, read, to look up, go ahead and try it. Um, one of the better ways to search on his site is actually doing it through Google, you know, so put in, like I could put Muscle Abe Stroll and then site FultonHistory.com. You don't have to deal with his weird interface that way. You still have the weird file names, but it, it he just has tons and tons and tons of stuff there. He could, you on put the, that, could you put that in chat too, how you would 
Google it. Oh, I, I don't think so. people are aware of how you can okay. search an internal site, uh, search a site. Ah, okay. One of the things you can do with Google is search a specific site. So in fact, the way I just found the URL I wanted for the online archive, online newspaper archive page, I Googled online newspaper archives like this. Online newspaper archives site. Oops, I didn't do it that. I did that search on Google. So you can use the site as a way to restrict where it looks. You do site colon and then do the base URL. So not www.wikipedia.org, just wikipedia.org. So with him, you would do, you know, if I wanted to look for, I could do Mosca Leib Struhl on site fultonhistory.com. And it will only show me results for pages that have Muscalab Stool on them. Because I know I want to look at Fulton history. I want a specific site. But his site is really weird. Uh, I've actually. And, then, and note, note that Janice is using quotation marks around the yeah. names so that Google isn't looking yeah. just. Just like you can do it, it with any search in Google. If you put quotation marks, it's looking for that phrase. I didn't do that with the newspaper archive page search because I couldn't remember the order on the page for the name of the page. And that was why I couldn't find it when I was looking in Wikipedia. I got the order wrong and it said, oh, I can't find it. Google was smarter than Wikipedia and it found the page. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can always put quotes around something when you're searching in Google and it'll search for that specific phrase only. Anyway, so yeah, that, that that is an excellent resource for New York upstate or New York City newspapers at this point. Other ones, I mean, he has such a weird mix. There are some Jewish newspapers in his collection. There are some Jewish newspapers in Chronicling America. Let me see. Uh, Chron wait, Chronicling America dot L O C dot gov. Chronicling America, yeah. Chronicling America is the one I said, your tax dollars at work. It's part of a federal mandate that all states should be preserving their historical newspapers. Um, and so they digitize them. They put them on Chronicling America with federal funding. If a state has gone beyond just the federal funding and has gotten some other funding to do more, uh, you know, digitize more newspapers, those do not go on Chronicling America then that state will probably create its own newspaper site so it can have both sets. So Colorado mm -hmm. has what's on Chronically America and other stuff. California does, Washington state does. Um, it all depends on, Oregon even does. It depends on what that state has done as far as funding to digitize stuff. And there are still some states, wait, no, I think finally Chronically America has every state represented. I think South Dakota was one of the last. Okay. But those are those are great ways to get into newspapers. I mean, you could just look at the Wikipedia page and see what kind of stuff exists online for the states and the countries you're researching. Um, Latvia uh, actually has a really nice digitized online historical newspaper archive, as an example. I wanted to um, share with you also a better picture of that Hungarian gravestone. Janice, so that you can see here that N-E at the end of Monk-Ne, ah. yep. which is, again, the Hungarian way of saying Mrs. Moore Monk. And again, yes, the last name is first. And then underneath it has her maiden name, Schoenhauser Maria. Up in the Hebrew section, I got really lucky because uh, it says that her Hebrew name was uh, Merle, um, and her uh, and her uh, mother's name was Bertha Fromm, F R O M M. -M. So I got a wow. lot of information there. From apparently is similar to the Yiddish expression from, which I understand means religious. So maybe there's another hint there. I don't know, but. Um, Cool. You know, there's there's nothing like 
getting your feet on the ground for some of these records, yeah. especially the gravestones. Well, absolutely. And for European tombstones, the Hebrew names, I think, are much more likely to be correct, especially the historical ones. What you have when people come over to the States and they start assimilating is maybe they don't use the Hebrew names as much anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to some of my cousins who don't remember what their Hebrew names were from their bar mitzvahs. Yeah. Um, so if the person doesn't remember, whatever gets put on the tombstone, obviously, oh, that person's dead now. He's, he's not even there to tell his descendants, I don't remember. So as people assimilate and they use those names less often, then you're more prone to having either mistakes or just omissions on the tombstones. And you're absolutely right. Even gravestones are wrong. You know. Oh yeah. That's well, why you know, it's like the death certificate. Who's giving the information? Does that person remember? Did the person ever know? Or is 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 that is he guessing? If he knew, does he remember? And it's a stressful time. Dad just died. The only one I am pretty sure the information on one death certificate I had to get was right because I'm reading all this and informant deceased. What? <laughs> like did they hold a seance but when i went back over it she had checked herself into the hospital and so they took the information that she provided when she you know create when they created the file but look at informant deceased <laughs> yeah i did a double take <laughs> <laughs> all but right who else who else yeah, I was gonna say like any that? other questions yeah everything's as clear as mud no, you're, it's actually um, quite comprehensive. I think a, a number of us are thinking of all the new homework you've given us to do. That's true. Well, uh, and, you will note that on my and, handout, I have my email address. So if you have questions later, you can email me. I will not do research for you for free, but I will be happy to answer questions pointing you to where you might be able to find records or stuff like that. That's very generous, uh, generous, Jana, Janice. And I also wanted to say I appreciate your sense of humor. You <laughs> did make me laugh um, quite a bit on a subject that could be just, you know, a simple rundown of information. I, I noticed you laughing a lot. So thank you very much, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I want to, again, thank Janice for her time. Thank you all for showing up. Ava and Lee, thank you for being there just in case I had a technological or baby meltdown everything just went off uh, like clockwork as it should and I hope um, I'll see many of you if not all of you at our December 3rd or December 10th meeting I'll be in touch about that as well in the meantime try not to focus on the bad stuff that's in the news let's try to remember um, that even when things are bad we can reach out to each other and find hopefully some peace and joy in our daily lives as well. All right, everybody, do well, be well, enjoy your researching. Janice, I'll be in touch. Thank okay. you all. Bye-bye.